Welcome, welcome. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. I can see a few people logging on now, which is perfect. We should be starting shortly. There we go. Come on, guys, let's log on if we can. Oh, the number is increasing. I like that. All right. So, first of all, good afternoon, good morning, good evening. Um, welcome to uh webinar on affecting the power of storytelling which is going to be, uh, at a, well, I should say, I the audience and the power of storytelling, which is going to be presented by my colleague, John Paul Sherrington. Uh, my name is Tim Lai. I'll be your host. Uh, I wanted to just say thank you for everybody who's managed to log on this afternoon. And we do apologize on last week. We had a few technical issues, but I have to say, um, you're, a great, you're a great crowd and, and we really appreciate your support as well today. So a few housekeeping rules from our side. If we can, let's try to keep our microphone switched off. That will just allow us to make sure that we can, uh, we don't have any echoing sounds or any background sounds whilst JP is doing, oh, well, I should say John Paul is actually doing the presentation himself, okay? If you have any questions, please use our chat box. We'll be monitoring that the whole day. There will be a period where we'll probably ask you towards the end of the, of the webinar. I will probably go through some of the questions with you and answer some of the questions as well. So don't be alarmed. We're trying to get to everybody as much as we can. Now, a few things about CSC itself. Please. Here at CSC, we focus on understanding organizations' training needs as well as delivering bespoke solutions. In the UK, we're just a supplier to many of our, uh, His Majesty's government departments, public agencies from the Home Office, FCO. Civil Service Commission and College of Policy. Our most popular series of courses include the leadership and management, uh, as well as accountability and governance, as well as personal development. I will be now handing over to my colleague, uh, John Paul Sherrington, and he'll be leading us through our webinar. So I hope everybody enjoys the webinar. And I said, we look forward to answering any questions that you might have after as well. Thank you. Over to you, JP. Hello. Um, I hope everyone can hear me and see me. Um, please uh, feel free as I'm I'm going to talk for about 10 to 15 minutes with a couple of uh, points um, to ask you some very straightforward and hopefully quite fun questions. Um, I'm going to outline the the ethos behind this course. It's not going to be a, a 20 minute version of the full day course. So we're going to look at the ethos of it, um, why we're why we're running it, and why why the people at um, Civil Service College have asked me to design the course in this way, and and leaning into some of my previous experience in my previous career as a um, as a theatre director and a, a lecturer in drama and theatre, and also a writer in theatre. Before about 10, 12 years ago, I moved into working more in communications, um, in politics and training in, in the political world and, the, and across the charity sector, the civil service sector. Um, so I'm going to take you through a, a short PowerPoint. Um, if you have any questions as we go along, um, if, we can, if you can type those in the chat and then uh, my colleagues in the office will um, collect those as we go along. There might be some. There's going to be a couple of points where I'm going to ask everyone to share um, a couple of things. So if you can type those in as well um, when we get to them. And then at the end of the session, we'll deal with those questions and anything else that comes up. Um, some some will be um, with me about the content and anything about the uh, the, the logistics and um, and everything like that. Uh, Tend I will absolutely cover those things. Um, so here we go. Um, we're looking at the course is all about storytelling and why storytelling is important um, in our modern environments, perhaps now when there's such a glut of information um, as, as ever. But, but since humans emerged, um, whatever your belief system about that is, and completely independently around the globe in societies that, that didn't have any sort of connection and contact with it ever, for thousands or tens of thousands of years. Um, stories are the way that human beings have made sense of the world. Um, long before writing, 
was um, you know even invented, let alone widely used. Uh, stories explain the great mysteries of life. In hundreds of different languages, stories define communities, they bound them together, and they help people make sense of their lives. And often were told and shared orally around the campfire. In these societies, and even today, we share campfire stories, stories, poems, songs and dances, and pictures on caves and carved into wood and stone were the ways in which tribes, communities, societies passed on their knowledge, whether that's religious belief, whether that was where good hunting was, whether that was rituals and codes of behaviour from one generation to the next. Stories were really how information went longer and carried passed through longer than one human life. There were stories about how the fire was went to the gods. Didn't matter if it went from the gods and was stolen by Prometheus in the Greek culture. There were stories about what happened after we died. This is the the balancing of the feather of the truth when the human heart was weighed in Egyptian culture. It's a five or six thousand year old story. Um, and if the heart was weighed correctly, you went to Egyptian heaven. If not, you went to Egyptian version of hell, which is basically oblivion. Um, and even today, um, we have our stories and our heroes and our and our um, incredible stories. So whether they're whether they're realistic or not, we we have stories about struggling through, fighting for what's right, fighting against overcoming obstacles and trying to make sense of the world and their difficult choices. These days, in place of epic poems memorized by storytellers, we have multi-million pound movie franchises bringing stories to us. In instead of cave paintings, we have billions and billions of pixels and Dolby surround systems. Um, but we still have the same sense of stories affecting us and think thinking about what it is is important in our lives. And sometimes they're about great heroes as some of the things we looked at, but sometimes they're about very fragile creatures and trying to make sense of the world. Um, so it doesn't all have to be heroes and superheroes and gods and warriors. Sometimes the most affecting stories are when we think about what it's like to, to discover the world and explore the world through the eyes of an innocent. Now, I'm sure, and this is your first question, um, many of you will have encountered stories before you even went to school. Um, and you will probably have heard stories from your parents or teachers or nannies, depending on where you, how you were brought up. But you will have heard all these stories um, before. So I just want you to share in the box, um, in the chat box, any stories that stick with you now that you remember hearing or reading as a child, you know, either before school or perhaps in the first two or three years of primary schools. What stories now, for some of you, it might be 20 years ago, for some of us, it'll be 40 or 50 years ago. Um, what stories, or even longer, stick with you? Just share some of those in the box now, and that have some sort of meaning to you, um, that you heard when you were a child. There's some suggestions there, but there'll be plenty more. OK, so we've got uh, chicken licking, the sky's falling. <laughs> we've got Kareem, uh, the little princess. Also have little Adam, prince. the great bird, Venus and other predicaments. I've got Karen, Sunday school Bible stories. I've got Caroline Miller, Aesop's Blues. Who else do we have? We've got Mike, the little grey men. <laughs> Sarah, <laughs> book of fairy poems. Uh, Carol. Oh, we have fables. That's quick. I, I can't read quick enough. Uh, yeah, so we've got these are, these are brilliant. Wardrobe. They're all are brilliant. It's also you know, giving you a good like sense the, of the average Dr. age of people in the audience. <laughs> um, Doctor Who books, Simon, yeah. we like that. Elizabeth, we've got myths of the Greek and Roman gods. Interesting one. The boy who said the dark in the Netherlands, Charles Parrish. Then we've got Denise with, uh, that's disappeared actually. Well, fairy tales and fables. Hazel. <laughs> Far away wishing tree. This is okay. Great. Already we're sharing um, them. This is great. What else do we have? <laughs> Malcolm and Nancy's story. Laura, Alfie gets locked in another Alfie stories. <laughs> oh, so is, uh, Elizabeth's tickle the dump brilliant. was awesome. It's so good. Now, hopefully, 
Alan, the Jolly Postman. So really interesting. I mean, is that everybody? Come on, guys. Let's, let's, let's that's keep good. shouting that, them out. That's good. That gives us a good uh, flavor. Thomas the Tank Engine. Uh, we've got How My Dad Met My Mom. I like that. <laughs> so is more stuff with me. That's Caroline Miller. Okay. Uh, we've got Sherry uh, Pilgrim's Progress. Mm. Samantha, how much do you love me? I love you this much. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, Brilliant. this is this is fabulous. Charles, right? another this is a nice the little wolf. trip mm -hmm. down memory lane. Okay, so we can probably let's 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 pick let's carry on again. Animal farm. Parkle, yeah. Animal farm. Wow. Okay, so there's Brilliant. a huge range of stories there. A lot of them will be familiar. You're on mute and... for me, JB. Oh. Okay. okay, can you hear me again now? So there's a huge range of stories there. Um, we can date some people quite clearly <laughs> for the average age in our group. Um, but also what's what's amazing, isn't it, is, is when we get to a certain age that we start sharing stories that we remember with our children or our nieces and nephews and even our grandchildren. So these stories carry on. Some of them were written in our lifetimes. Some of them, we've got the Greek and the Roman gods ones and the fables and the Grimm's tales. They're hundreds or even thousands of years old. So, but they, they somehow, they stay with us. Um, and they, they're kind of shared points. You know, some of them are um, allegories, Pilgrim's Progress, Animal Farm. Others are just kind of exciting, fun or silly. But they're all about they're all about something. And in the end, they're about more than a story. I'm just going to this is a pure this isn't this is a pure coincidence. Um, I, I wouldn't have had this if the, if the, the uh, session had gone on last Thursday. But over the weekend, I've been doing some spring cleaning and cleaning out some boxes of things. Um, and I'll just, I just can see this, but this is I found this from my primary school, which is a list of my favorite books when I was eight. Um, and it's all it's all written terribly neatly. I wish my handwriting was that good now. But I've got on this one, Danny, the champion of the world, which I think somebody had, which is a Roald Dahl. Uh, the Last Battle. Um, that's a C.S. Lewis Narnia story. There's a couple of those. The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. That's another one. I've got James and the Giant Peach, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. and um, the Magic Faraway Tree, which I think several people had that one, which is Enid Blyton kind of um, moon face and up in, up in the going kind of a different land would rotate around the top of a tree every day, every week, and you had to get out before you could get trapped. Um, and there's only one on this list of eight there that I don't remember. It's called Travelling Magic. Um, I have no re recollection of that at all, but obviously my eight year old self um, really liked it. So. The point, the point of this isn't just to reminisce, it's just to think about how these stories will have stayed with us. And probably if you you could take a good shot at, at saying what this story was about, if not remembering certain moments or incidents in it, um, to people even today, 10, 20, 30, 40, I won't go any higher, but years later. Um, I'll just have a think about how many presentations you've been in in the past month where you'd struggle to, to have that sign of, same kind of level of recall and certainly things that you were you were doing last year whether in your current job or a previous one a year or six months ago or even two or three years ago um and what we, we're trying to think about is how can you tell stories which have something capture in some way that sense of um that, that sense of retention that connection with people okay um how do we kind of make our audiences react like this like excited and wrapped and putting their hands up and engaged and asking questions rather than, as I certainly know for having been a lecturer part of my career, and many of you will know, that sort of reaction as people get a little bit older and uh, phones and become more distracting. So they've got comfier chairs, but they're not anywhere near as engaged as those children. Um, one of the things that I've spent a long time doing is trying to think how to get actors to stand on a stage in front of this kind of environment, but um, full of people, hopefully, sometimes terribly empty, and tell their stories, okay? And that sort of environment, that's quite intimidating. And actors have weeks or months of rehearsal sometimes and time to prepare, um, and also often building on several years of really specific training. Okay, but that environment isn't any more intimidating than this environment, which probably much more familiar to many of you. Um, 
what we're, we're still telling stories to an audience and inside that audience of potentially bored, potentially engaged adults are those little children who all remember Danny the Chanson of the Worlds and Pilgrim's Progress and The Boy Who Cried Wolf and Phantom Tollbooth, which is another favourite of mine I saw. So how can we get the attention and reawaken that little child that's interested, that's engaged, that wants to listen and doesn't just kind of want to finish the meeting and get out? Um, as quickly as possible. One of the things we need to do is realise that when we're telling stories, um, if we're spend getting people in the room, whether that's a theatre, conference room, conference hall, or just a meeting room, um, it's a very different, uh, it's a very different approach. If we're if we're delivering information in person to somebody rather than just sending an email, okay, um, a little back to some of you may know but when a reasonable kind of speed for public speaking is about 100 to 110 120 words a minute the most people reading uh can read about 300 words a minute and if it's things you're familiar with or if it's kind of long complicated and uh, let's say slightly boring policy documents um that you're familiar where you're familiar with the information you don't read every single word um then you might you can read at three to four hundred words a minute um, so in terms of time and efficiency, it's much easier to give people things to read. But in terms of engagement, it's much more important, as we know, to be telling stories. Now, we can tell stories in, in well-written text, and that's, we'll look at that as, as part of what we do in, in the training day. But a lot of what I'm talking about is, 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 is the actually being in front of people, engaging with people, whether that's in a meeting, whether that's presenting to a team, or whether that's presenting to a big audience. Okay. So my experience um, for the first almost two decades of my career um, was working as a director. I came uh, from a background um, quite academic in, in, a, in a school that didn't have any sort of theatre tradition really. I think we did a couple of plays at primary school, um, but there was no, no real theatre. So I didn't, didn't really engage with theatre uh, until I was doing my GCSEs and A-levels. And then we went to see a couple of productions um, for, for Shakespeare and a couple of other shows that we were looking at as part of our school. But when I got to university, I was reading English literature um, and I got more and more engaged and started changing all my courses to do more and more theatre courses. I had no inclination and no talent as an actor, but I did like the role of a director because to me that felt like bringing together lots of other talented people, good actors, good musicians, good designers, um, good technicians um, and, and pulling together and telling the story by using all the strength of these other people. Um, so I was always thinking if I, I can't draw well, but, but um, so I always did better productions when I was able to work with a designer. Um, I had to act in a couple of productions of mine because the people were ill or there just wasn't the money to pay somebody to say four lines and bring on a spear or something. But um, if I was if I was acting in it, it was no, you know, it was it was it was never good. But but I knew what it was great when I was working with amazing actors and um, it was really good to work with some of the, you know, both writers that have been published or uh, hundreds of years old, Shakespeare and Greeks, and also work and, and forge plays with contemporary writers. I did a lot of new writing. And I even wrote um, some work, particularly for children, uh, myself. So it's all about, in the end, telling stories. And a lot of what I did, particularly early in my career, was to young audiences. Um, I would take one hour versions of Shakespeare into schools that couldn't afford to go to the theatre or didn't have any sort of concept. Schools like mine you know, that, that, that really didn't have any sort of theatre department or, or, um, or drama teaching. Um, so, so you take a take a bunch of six or seven actors into a into a school, set up in their school hall, and do a performance there. I did um, lots of work around various issues in theatre and education companies, um, uh, you know, which would deal with bullying or using drugs or sexual health and those kind of things, um, which we'll be quite familiar with. Um, and I also did a lot of work, um, which is like history based plays in the curriculum, which eventually emerged. And evolved into me working with um, a company that produced the horrible histories um, on stage. Um, so <laughs> terrible picture of rehearsals, but that's where you spend most of your life before you go into a theatre space. Um, and the horrible histories um, was really about taking two or three actors, but telling all sorts of stories 
um, in front of people and engaging people. Um, now, the books are brilliant, but the, but the as many of you will know from the TV shows and the theatre shows, which actually developed completely separately, um, there was there was a really important, there was a really great way of, of engaging children in what would often be considered quite dry. Sorry, the yes. questions that just came up from uh, Ian here. I thought it would be nice for us to just answer it now. He's asking, is voice projection important? Uh, yes, it it is. Um, and, it, and it can be learned um, with some simple techniques. Um, and also, uh, but more and more, you'll find that you don't need to project hugely. It's more about speaking clearly um, and being aware of what you're doing and a very different environment rather than projecting. Because most times now you will have microphones um, and actually what you need to do is to actually resist projecting too much when you've got microphones, otherwise you get cracking. So using uh, these days, um, using microphones is is probably as important as voice projection. In, mo in certainly in kind of professional uh, situations. Um, but if you're in a theatre, uh, yeah, and you're in a conference hall and there's no mic, that's fairly unusual these days, but but yeah, that's important. And certainly anyone who's done any teaching, I used to teach teenagers and people in the early chances, you have to be able to shut people up with a little bit of volume, but you don't want to be shouting all the time. We'll remember those kind of shouty teachers. So the, the idea is to keep, to, to have enough presence and, um, and control of the space to keep people quiet so that you can, you, you don't have to force force it too much but part of what we do um we'll be looking at how you project but we we also the, the college there's several other courses on presentation skills in which we can look at um voice projection a little bit more um but but actors that's kind of a key part of their training obviously and um so doing that and then doing vo projecting your voice while you're dealing with complicated costume changes and props and moving and dancing and singing silly songs and doing a funny accent um that's that's why they get that's why uh, actors train so long often you just have to try and be yourself which may or may not be um an easier job de <laughs> depending on how you feel about public speaking um so what i'd like to think about now the second question is think of a moment it can be in a theater show or it can be in a um in a presentation just think of a moment where you've really just remembered that specific moment and think about why that why that was. So what's what kind of moment makes you feel like this? Either the pennies just dropped or you're completely engaged. Can you think of any bit any times in plays or in presentations or any live performance where you've just suddenly felt like that and you can't wait for the next moment or second or, or information or scene? So just we'll just pause for a second and let people think of kind of just particular moments you might be able to describe, you know. Um, in plays or presentations, which really stayed with you um, for weeks or months or years. Give you a little bit of time to think about that. So we've got Elizabeth here. Um, she's saying I don't recommend in private lives in London. It was just mesmerizingly captivating and completely seductive. He had the audience in the palm of his hand. I have Simon, when Hedda Gabler shoots herself. And then we've got um, Karen. When I care about the character or the topic and when it resonates with something important to me. That's... So we've only got three at the moment, guys. Are we all still thinking? Let's go. So. Please speak up. Uh, the Crucible, Arthur Miller, where they all start accusing each other of being possessed by the devil. Like that. Um, Laura Timkinson, the end of Cabaret. I didn't know the story so hit hard and I was eight months break at the time. Oh, um, oh they're coming fast now. Like that. So, Sarah, during a presentation on our director said we're in this together and going through this as one. Uh, we've got is it Ali? Uh, Michael Ball, I've loved every theatre show I've seen him. I've seen him in. It looks like he's genuinely having fun and that draws off onto father. the audience. She, uh, look, I'm your father. That's from Chris. Um, then we've got Ian, when Doctor Who regenerated in 1984. How many times has he gone through regeneration? That's a rhetorical, Ian. We'll probably ask you towards the end. Um, so we've got John, Prima Farsi, Jody, Jody Coma, the whole, the whole show. Picks it every session. Okay, I don't want. Um, 
JBS Chin then replying to you when Dr. O regenerated in Edible at the end of Tom Baker. All right. Well, Ethan, they're one of the Peaky Blinders series where it ends with Tommy nearly ending his life, left myself and the whole family on the edge of our seat waiting for the next series. Um, Emma, Jenny Coma, utterly transfixing the audience in the one woman play Prima Farsi. Okay. Samantha, we bought as you. <laughs> I think that's clear, straightforward, that one. Um, I think I missed a few. Let me see if I missed a few here. Um, Let's go. Oh, Diana, she mm -hmm. said thriller movies or documentaries. That's right up my street. Actually, prefer mental documentaries also. Um, then we've got, I think that was the only one I missed, Jackie. Any more suggestions, guys? Come, let's, uh, let's contribute. We'll try and read out yours as well, as you can tell. So, Carol. Oh, so there's an argument regarding the regeneration here. Yeah, so we somebody say Tom Baker, no, Peter Davison, okay. Um, <laughs> I think we can list all of them. Um, so we've got Carol, a lot of the flies and how we continue to organize ourselves and where that can lead. Interesting there. Um, oh my God, the, the Doctor Who Wolf has already started. <laughs> oh dear, I'm older than I thought. Um, go Charles, taxi driver when he receives a letter from the parents thanking him for rescuing their daughter. The sixth ending, I like that one as well. The end of the last Bond movie, how did they come back from that, Chris? <laughs> I know, uh, that's a difficult one. We've got Claire, um, go theatre, I meet someone on ice stream when it actually started to softly rain down on us meet performance. Oh, that must have been a great experience, actually. Um, then we've got Luis, The Handmaid's Tale. Several episodes are just heart stopping. Oh. Okay. Helen, the ending of Shut Up. <laughs> Um, oh, the marine iguana and the race of snakes. I don't like snakes. Mm. <laughs> I grew up in the southern hemisphere, so honestly, I don't like snakes. Um, come on, guys, let's let's keep going. Unless uh, we're all out of stories. Here we go. Charles so, and Trim Peaks, the really fighting scene in the back lodge. Mm -hmm. I second that. Uh, Christine, anything with the plot? <laughs> Sounds like my other colleague in here, Christine, when you say that. Um, then, yeah, scene from Charles. Yeah. Ah, Ian, when JR got shot in Dallas. <laughs> I don't think a lot of people know what Dallas is, Ian, uh, if you continue with that. Um, Samantha, it's quite the thing. Okay, so what we bothers you, there's a comment between that was responded to. So it's all quiet. They think the idea of his view has failed, and then they realize that a tree is blocking the road. There's a mile long queue of people waiting to visit the zoo. I think that was JP responding to you there, Samantha. So, and then I'm loving the interaction. Um, so let's keep going. Brilliant. We've got Charles again, the end of the now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll continue now. OK, can you hear me? Great. So, um, yeah, there's some really amazing moments there. But again, in films, there's a really there's great moments. And what you've identified, some of you, is is when you care about what's happening, when you care about the characters or, or the or the creatures involved. Um, but also when when things that happen that are unexpected, and also there's some there's some moments. The, the last one that came up, Charles and Heston at the end of the Planet of the Apes, is just a really powerful image of the kind of of not the kind of the statue, the head of the Statue of Liberty, and he realizes that it is Earth after all, and there's just this character on horseback and this huge long shot of what used to be New York and is now just a a beach. Um, so fantastic things there. Who shot Jr. Kind of dramatic, and there was that. It was the kind of spinning chair, wasn't there, on the back of it, and all the build up on that. And some great mo there's some just amazing moments which you stick with you. And that JR thing, that was 1980 ish, wasn't it? Some of those. The, and the the, uh, the Doctor Who was the, the early 80s. Um, I was remembering the the, the, diff the wrong one, but they're both they're both sort of key points which stick in your mind. Um, and the last Bond movie, you know, this, this hugely powerful image. So 
as theatre directors and theatre creators are constantly trying to create images which stick in people's mind, uh, which are about the character at that moment and also about something much more profound. Um, this image is, some of you may have seen this production, this is uh, David Tennant um, after Doctor Who, as we've got a theme going, um, but with the skull in Anne Hamlet in the Gravedigger scene. And I don't know if you know, but, but um, this actually was a real human skull that somebody who was a sh huge Shakespeare fan had basically donated their own skull to be used in the production of Hamlet when they died. Um, so I think they use that in the publicity, but it's quite a remarkable, um, quite a remarkable thing. But this is an image not just from David Tennant, what, about 15 years ago, but that, that was an image when Shakespeare was um, right, wrote Hamlet in the, in the very early 1600s. Um, and what, if, <laughs> as I remember from my English literature, um, that w once he started to write schools, then schools were in every single play, and there were schools and contemplations on death in every single play by all of Shakespeare's competitors and uh, contemporaries. Um, so, so it says it, it's about a moment in the play, but it's also something much more profound, um, which is Hamlet reflecting on mortality of, of him and everybody and just kind of coming face to face with this skull of Yorick the jester who he remembers as a, as a jester when he was a child. And so there's an ageing mortality it's a hugely kind of powerful, profound moment, which comes at a point when the play is just about to kind of push into its final act, really, push into final gear, and nearly everybody get killed, including Hamlet. Um, so the, the Doctor Who chat is off. Once, you, once you're allowed that into a chat, that's it. That's it. It's all over. Um, <laughs> um, but this, in a presentation, is I would say an equally powerful moment. Um, for those of us who remember it, this is 2008, January 2008, when Steve Jobs walked on to the app very casually, carrying what many of us will recognise as those ubiquitous envelopes that are around all offices in the 90s and the 2000s. Um, and then just halfway through, he just took out the MacBook Air out of it. Um, I would say that is, is a kind of moment that sticks with people um, even now. Um, and, and is, is as powerful, if used well, as the image of Hamlet and the skull. So it, they can look like gimmicks, but sometimes if you have to do a talk or presentation, creating an image which just highlights or is a key moment uh, that you want your audience to remember helps to give them something to hook on the emotion, the hook on the, the actual point or the key moment of the lecture the lecture, the presentation, whatever it is. Sometimes it can be visual, sometimes it can be a feeling, sometimes it can be an unexpected moment, a turn, a plot twist, as several people said. Uh, something like that um, is really is really important uh, to just engage the audience and somehow fill up the space. Um, so what we do in the course, in the training, is take you from somebody who's been asked to do some sort of storytelling presentation, whether that's in a to a team, to a meeting, to a conference, I might be feeling completely stuck like that and try and give you ideas about how you can present the information so that it's engaging. OK, you might have your script, you might have your information. How do you prepare that? We'll look at how you tell stories, because that isn't always about giving people huge amounts of information. Remember what I said, um, it's 100 words a minute if you're speaking, it's three to 400 words a minute if you're reading. So. If you've got people for 10 or 15 minutes, you can only you can only do a thousand words. So all of those words need to earn their place and you don't need to explain everything. What you might want to do is just engage people enough, give them enough information that they're going to again go and read your full policy report or your or, or your email or the document or whatever they need to do to take it further. You do, storytelling is often about show showing people, not actually telling them everything, but showing them and engaging them, engaging their curiosity. Um, we can look at, there, is, there are many structures in of stories and storytelling and some of those that you can, but most structures effectively break down into three parts. The hero, and that can be the, the that can be Superman or Batman or, or Doctor Who, or it can be Grogu, starts off on a journey and they have to face something alone, but they have to leave. They have to go and do something. They have to change something. Um, 
they will, they will then have to face and fight some sort of struggle. Um, whatever that is, that can be a sequence of things that can be escaping for something, it can be overcoming something, but there's some sort of struggle and difficulty. And that's the bulk of the story. How that person escapes from the chains, breaks through what they need to do. Um, and then at the end of the story, and this is often forgotten, there's the homecoming. What happens when they get back? How are they changed? How are they different? Do they come back home? Yeah. How, how are they? Are they wiser? Are, are they saved their family? But what's what's the impact? What's the point of the story? If you go out and kill the dragon and get back home again, what have you learned? Yeah. Why is Bilbo Baggins different at the end of The Hobbit than he is at the beginning? Um, or even Stuart Little when he's been in the city. So the, the key point of the storytelling is to say that if you engage, if you can engage an audience, if you're aware of structure and you can't do everything, but you're always selective about what you tell and and that how you tell people things um, and make them feel things um, is more important than giving huge amounts of information, then you can arouse their curiosity. You don't have to you don't have to tell them everything. You can show them things, you can engage them and you can start to try and present your audience with things which they want to be involved in. So they become they become wrapped and attentive and they're hanging on to the next thing you're going to say. They don't they can't predict it. They don't know everything in advance. Um, and and if you can engage them, them emotionally as human beings, as the little children inside that they were when they first heard stories, um, rather than just delivering a load of dry facts and information, you're much more likely to have them remember and retain and act on that information, which really is your objective of telling the story, so that there's been some sort of change. So it's not just the heroes in the story that go through a change, it's the audience, the, the people you're pitching to, the people you're talking to. They themselves have gone on some sort of journey and story and are different at the end than they are at the beginning. This is one of my favourite quotes, it's good behind a lot of my work in communications. Um, Maya Angelou, the the, the um, amazing uh, American black woman writer and Nobel laureate. Um, I've learned that people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And that in the end, with all stories, no matter how dry the information, that is what maintains people's interest. That is what engages people and captures their imagination and is the best way of, of keeping people interested, curious and engaged with what you want to share with them. So that's a summary of the philosophy behind um, the course that we do. You can probably guess there are there are there are things that we can learn in terms of techniques um, to think about how we structure things, how we write, how we use language, how we actually present in front of people if we are doing live presentations, which this is largely based upon. Although you can, of course, tell stories just in text, but it's a it's a, a storytelling in text and storytelling in, in performance or certainly in, in front of human you know, in front of people. Um, in person and even indeed on the screen, like I'm doing now, um, they are very different uh, ways of communicating, and it's really important you're aware of the of the of the way in which you're the venue, if you like. Are you going eyeball to eyeball, or are you going through the ears of people in a small group or in a big group? Because that will hugely affect how you should structure and tell your story. So it's about considering your how how you're going to tell the story, why you're telling it, what you want to tell, and what you want people to feel. And then at the end, hopefully remember and act on at the end. Um, and ideally retain it um, for longer than when the next presentation is. So that's an outline of the philosophy behind the course and some of the things that we'll cover. I'm really happy now to take questions from people. Um, uh, probably let's not get into who's the best doctor. If you can, uh, can but, we um, <laughs> please ask JP as many questions as we can. Uh, we use the list, uh, the list, well, I'll say the remaining time to probably answer as many questions as we can. So just like before, we're very interactive with our, with our chat box. Let's do that. Um, I think it's been a really, really good session. So if we can, I'm waiting for the first, first question. Let's go.
Laura, is there a moment you recall about using storytelling technique to manage a big organizational change? Then after Laura, I'll probably go to Samantha, then she's got a question as well, so. Over to you, JB. I think there was a, uh, I was working with a, a really uh, good friend and colleague of mine a couple of years ago on a, on a quite complicated charity project where um, everyone was working remotely. It was just, it started during the COVID lockdown and kind of came out of that, but it was a public project. So, and it was spread all over the country. Um, and we rarely got to meet in person as a team. Um, and it was it was quite fragmented. And, and while everyone was bought into the project, it was it was about uh, the, the black British experience and, and kind of racism and, and the, the, the history and the repercussions of, of, of slavery, but also as a celebration of, of modern British culture and all its variety and diversity. Um, but it was on one of the teen days when just to pull things together, we just started looking at what people's um, I, I think there was there was a, basically imagining ourselves as superheroes and imagining what was our superpower and how we got it. And that was a it was a it was an interesting sort of team building thing. But actually, the way that people presented those things and people that you'd worked with at all sorts of levels, from kind of uh, administrative level to very, very senior kind of international, uh, the people who were like, leading the, the, the project. Um, it was it was fascinating to to see how people felt and how they felt their skills, what they th felt was good and how those things had developed. And so storytelling itself, that was and that was able that that enabled us to kind of work much more strongly as a team and kind of bring the team, pull the team together. So in terms of organizational change, it was um, it, it was really about kind of getting everybody on the same on the same page and understanding that the different skills that we all had as team members were were all very helpful to working together. Um, and just so by using that kind has, of superhero uh, super power thing, how do you really measure the words per minute ratio when you speak? I know Samantha, Samantha's going to hand up. Sorry, JP. Um, if you can just ask us a question in the chat box, Samantha, that would be great. Okay. Um, but back to um, Ian's question: How do you measure the words per minute ratio when you speak? Um, you can you can record it easily. I mean, it's it's really easy to do a work out in a document and then just read it as as you're speaking. You always think you can say more when you're writing. <clears throat> I do a lot of uh, speech writing for fairly senior senior people, uh, and it's often you, you the temptation is to write 150 words and then you know and, and kind of get them to cram it into that we can do that in a minute if you speak quickly but much more effectively is the use of pause is the use of repetition and if you're cramming loads of information and it reduces the time to compete to 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 cram it to sorry if you're repeating things a lot um which is really important sometimes for rhetorical reasons or just to really make a message clearly you you realize that when you're speaking you you can't you can't uh, even a hundred words, if forty or fifty of them are repeated, you can't uh, you you can't get as much information across as you want to. Um, so I write questions sometimes for for people in the House of Lords in the Commons where there's a really strict time limit, um, like literally a minute, and you've got sixty five or seventy words, and you've got you've got to get your question across um, as quickly as you can. So actually writing writing concisely and and saying. It is in as few words as possible is very important. Um, and I would always say shorter is better than longer. You know, there's there's a there's a reason we have an interval in theatres between 45 minutes and an hour, particularly if you've got a, a young people's audience, because it's a lot, it's a lot of words and a lot of information coming at you. Um, but but you can easily measure how quickly you speak by just just recording it and then counting how, how far you get through through the speech. Um, it's a useful technique to know. Next question. Um, this is from Simon. They say a picture tells a thousand words. What are your favorite examples uh, of uh, public enough? Sorry. So they say a picture tells a thousand words. What are your favorite examples of really powerful images? Um, well, I've, I think I've used some of them in my presentation. I think it, it depends on the situation. We'll remember all sorts of in, in plays and theater that's often about creating a moment. You know, and often holding that moment where nothing is really happening except except what you're seeing there, whether that's Hedda Gabler being shot or whether that's just somebody walking through a door. Um, one of the best, one of my favourite moments in theatre was that I created in the show I did was was to get 
uh, somebody to open a door really slowly. So somebody just noticed the door handle turning and there was a sense of like, if if the husband comes back and sees what's what's happening in the room now, it's going to be a disaster because the guy's a psychopath. And and we not it wasn't until the dress rehearsal that we realised that the guy was just kind of coming in and bursting in. And actually, when we held, we we held, I asked him just to take count of 10 as he opened the door. And the whole theatre was looking at this this door handle turning really slowly. And you could hear the audience kind of, kind of tensing up as it as it went on. So there are there are moments like that you can you can create uh, images. Um, and if you're doing something in a, in a very public forum, um, you know you're looking for your kind of either your Twitter clip or your little you know even your kind of front page uh, image. So you know Boris Johnson was uh, very good at this, waving the brick and the fish or the kind of bursting through the the Brexit wall. You know whether whether you agree or not with what he 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 did or does or what he's like he was extremely good at kind of creating those moments that would become the talked about moments that we can still remember those those speeches um so i think i think if you don't want if you're nerve if you're nervous or you you don't want to be too fiddly with props but sometimes just having a moment um in in a in a presentation can be really powerful way just to get to people to think all right, so JP, we'll, we'll ask, we'll, I'll ask you a couple more questions, probably three more questions. Then afterwards, um, I've got to say that everybody will try and answer uh, them as well after the, the webinar, because I know there's a few interesting questions that have come in, and I don't want you to feel left off. So we'll try and get back to everybody that we don't get back to during this chat. So next question, um, that's from um, Angel Line. Would you recommend defining emotional outcome before start communication? I, I think you need to know what you, what the outcome you want is. And when you're right, you should you should do that when you're preparing your presentation. You need to know what you want people to feel at the end. So what's the call to action? What's the point? What's the purpose of doing this? Um, I don't. It's much better if people realize that themselves and experience it during rather than tell, by the end of this presentation, you're going to be feeling really happy or really sad or, well, you know, very silly example. But um, but you should certainly, when you're preparing, have a sense of what you want, how you want them to feel different at the end. Think of that journey uh, that you're taking them on. Um, so you should have a really clear sense of not just what your ask is at the end, but what you want them to do and feel at the end. And if they, if they, if you've convinced them emotionally, they're much more likely to want to go along with what you're, with what you're doing. I, th I thought this is a very interesting one, actually, a little bit different from the ones we've been getting. So what techniques work best in a boardroom where people at top hierarchical silos see themselves as um, making serious, let's see that, serious decisions whilst removed from the reality behind data? So I'll repeat that again, OK, because that was a yeah, bit I got shocked. it, I got it. So we, we'll try again. What techniques work? Best, what techniques work best in a boardroom where people are top hierarchical silos see themselves as making serious decisions whilst removed from the reality behind data? That's from Matthew. Yeah, I think I think that's a real challenge if you're speaking to more senior people, because one of the ways people can be objective and make making decisions is by distancing themselves from it and um, get, getting through those barriers, getting to communicate people if they don't have if they aren't going to be directly or personally affected by the outcomes that's that's really hard so you've got to engage you know you've got to engage their imagination whether that's taking a case study of a, this imagine this family you know if we do this policy i'm yeah i've got to be very vague but um if we did this this is how they would feel if we don't do this this is how they would feel so trying to en engage it emotionally because people often can hide behind Yes, decisions at this level, certainly in terms of public funding, need to be made kind of rationally. But there's also a sense of all the decisions are being made by human beings and will have an impact on human beings. And if I think if it's very easy to, to get that or to avoid avoid remembering that sometimes when you're making decisions. Um, and I, I, it's, it's, it's challenging because you've got to know what kind of person it is. But if you can engage people emotionally, you know, or just make them see it from a different point of view, which theatre is all about um, presenting lots of different points of view, having conflict all the time. You know, the best theatre works when you're not quite sure. Uh, say, say there's a, feel, a, a, a play in which somebody's having an affair. Um, 
there's, there's an obvious moral kind of issue in that. But if you present the case um, that you understand where, where you understand why that may have happened or there's, there's difficulties in the marriage or the difficulty you can't you, you can't just present the present it clearly. These things are all very complicated. So so engaging with those sorts of situations, I mean, that have, that's like millions of plays been written about that. But understanding that things are complex and emotionally complex and are not black and white, it's not this isn't all good and this isn't all bad. Um, is a, emotions are a good way of kind of framing that information rather than just taking a very strong view and point, you know, because sometimes serious decisions are made because it's, it's simpler and things aren't always as sim that simple. So emotion, emotional engagement enables you to to address some of the complexity of the issues, I think, um, even even if you don't adjust them really directly. Right, so last one, um, yeah, this was from Sarah. So she says, any top tips, or, I, I think I'm assuming she means, any top tips where we can find, well, she says, any top tips where we find it difficult to be concise sometimes, especially when getting excited about a topic. And I spend a lot of my life working with executives and uh, C-suite and appreciate the one fee. She didn't finish the last bit for me, Sarah. So. The, if you can probably send that, that question in for me again, that'd be great. Then we can reread it out. But like I say, thank you very much for everybody's uh, questions. I'm not dismissing yours if I didn't read it out. We will monitor the chat box even after the session and we'll try and answer everybody's question. I know that JBs are looking forward to doing that. Now, Ted, I, I've got that that last question. I can read the. I can see the end of it. So it's it's like the the elevator version. Again, which one? The the, the, the yeah, the doing the very short version when mm -hmm. people have got really limited time. That that's really important. Is that if the clearer you are about what you want and how you how you can get that, the better. Of, often, if you are very enthusiastic, you can um, you can just end up filling a lot of the time and then running out of time. Um, the first, I did the first half of this presentation on the script and the second half um, talking more generally in response to the questions that were coming out and trying to adapt it as it was going on. Don't know if that was clear from 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 how it how it was. Um, I should watch it back when the webinar's uh, put online and and see how how different that makes it. But I knew I want I wanted to be aware of kind of keeping close to uh, the timings that we had and not kind of going going off on one um, as I'm as I'm doing this. Which which when you're sat in your room on your own is much easier to do than it is if you're in a room with other people where you're kind of aware of them you know getting bored or looking at the watch. I can't see anybody's reactions, um, so it's really difficult to 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 engage in this situation. So I find it hard on the screen to do it but i would say always when you're trying to say I, I i do this in some of the courses i deliver can you deliver what you want in a single sentence can you frame what you want in a single sentence can you do that in a single paragraph by that i mean three or four sentences and often that means really real clarity of thinking if you can define that at the beginning of your preparation um you know and uh some people, Alistair Campbell says this in one of his uh, books about comms. Um, if you have a word, a sentence and a paragraph, if you can do that, you've effectively got your title, your press C and your elevator pitch. Um, and if you can keep all that under 75 words, you know it's not going to be more than a minute. Brilliant. Thank you very much, JP. So I think there was a few questions regarding um, in the chat box. Where do you find the information regarding the course and and et cetera? So we're just going to share some. We're going to share a little bit on on the screen so that everybody can knows who to contact and what's going to happen next. So future courses, future course dates for persuasive storytelling. We've, as you can tell, we've got a few space. We've got one space left on the virtual on the 28th of March, but we've also got two additional dates: 16th of July, 4th of December. Duration is usually 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Um, we also offer face-to-face -face option. 19th September, um, we've got one which is duration, same time, 10 to 4 p.m. The names of my colleagues on the on the screen, so it has for out she's for our open courses. Um, so please do reach out to her if you want to join in on our open courses and Deborah, my other colleagues who are in our courses. So she'll be able to um, coordinate any or organize any in our programs that you might be interested in. Um, from us as well. So please feel free to go on our website. We've got a few come, upcoming webinars as well, which are scheduled, which you're going to share on screen with you as well. 
So we've got unlocking leadership potential, mastering conflict negotiation and stakeholder engagement. This is also with um, my other two colleagues, Ben and Keith Bleasdale. They usually specialize in our leadership and management courses. And I'll, I'll really, I'll probably encourage majority of the people who are in leadership and management, especially to, to log on to that one. It's going to be another crack off a webinar. So if you have any questions, like I said, please feel free to, to reach out to us. Um, our number was shared previous on the previous slide, but at the same time, we will be monitoring the chat box until probably 10 minutes after the, the webinar is done. But if if that, I think that's pretty much it from, from us um, and from JP as well. I want to say thank you. Thank you for logging back on. I know that last week we had a trying time, but uh, we appreciate you making the time to come back again today. And I hope everybody enjoyed the, the webinar itself. We're looking forward to seeing you on our courses. Um, but besides that, have a remain, good remainder of the week. And uh, hopefully we'll see you guys uh, on the 17th of April. 